Welcome back, uh, folks. Today, um, I'm actually really looking forward to today's conversation. And there's something that's actually very close to my heart. As most of you will know, uh, I like a bit of straight talk. And I happen to be listening to a futurist just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that struck me was this trend that we're seeing in, in society around the gap between what people say and what they do. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but in fact, if there is one particular bugbear I hate, this is whenever there's dishonesty or people say they're going to do something and they don't. And sadly, I'm, I hate to say it, but one of the things I'm a real stickler about is time. How many times I've gone to meet people and um, I sit there and I wait, you know, and I pretend that I'm being patient, but quite frankly, for the most part, I end up really pissed. Um, so that warning, folks, don't ever make, don't ever be late if you've got an appointment. <laughs> um, so, but today to talk about this in this in a bigger context, we are going to talk about the impact of things like this in an organization and where we work around teams. And really, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to say that I've got Marnie Jones here today. Um, Marnie is the director of a company called Talent X, and they are basically they're a people agency, and her work is about transforming companies through the hiring, the organizing and management of teams. Now, I'm not gonna to shed too much um, light on, on all the great things that we're gonna talk about today, because honestly, I really am interested in hearing from Marnie. You know, she's got a miraculous story about where she started. I think you'll find it pretty surprising how she landed where she did. But also, you know, at such, and I am gonna say young because I am a bit older, but <laughs> she's not that young, but I in the context of where I'm at, I would say what she's accomplished in her age and her wisdom really is outstanding. So Marnie, thank you firstly so much for joining me. Wow, thanks Carly. Um, so I do want to get struck, stuck straight in because you and I were having a little preamble before we started and um, the thing that immediately struck me was the work that you do when you first go into a company to talk to their team and doing team audits and, and why you do that and how that works. Can, so can we just jump straight there? Absolutely. So I, we have multiple services with our clients, but before we do anything with them, I am very picky about who I work with, honestly, from a very selfish perspective, because I can't be bothered working with someone who doesn't fulfill their promises or who, who wants something bigger than what they are or better than what they are. And I feel um, also that we've lost a lot of money. I don't even feel I know how much money we've lost by working with clients that actually aren't the right clients. So it's part selfishness um, for me as a business owner and being, it's actually a financial decision, but then also it extends to when we do hiring or when we do organizational projects with our clients, we, we have to know where they're at before we start. And we have to know if we're going to hire for them, that they are the right type of employer. And we feel comfortable saying to a candidate that, Hey, this person has a great company and you should work here because we have two clients when we're hiring. And I think that's also differentiated between us and normal recruiters is like, I don't want to have to refill this role later. We have replacement guarantees. And, and so we take that very seriously. So when we start with a client, we do a team audit and analysis, and we actually interview every single staff member. We ask 40 different questions, um, ranging from on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you here? How engaged are you in the future of this business? Do you see yourself here long-term? Would you like your role changed in any way? Are there any toxic personalities here? Would you say this company is organized? So there's a whole bunch of uh, questions. We then compile by the way, we make sure it's not anonymous and we do that on purpose because we want to we want to create an environment of honesty. And if they don't answer and they're like, I'd rather not answer that, I'll skip the question. That's kind of an answer in and of itself. If I'm like, are there any toxic personalities here? They're like, can we skip the question? I'm like, well, that's a yes. <laughs> so um, we really invoke that honesty because also if you don't, if you're not willing to say what it is that's happening, the owner can't fix it either. So there's no point in being like, I'm so miserable and this happened to me today and the owner doesn't know who it is. So we, we make sure it's not anonymous and then we sum summarize all of that data into a report. So we'll say, for example, 87% of your staff said that you were not organized. So that feeds into not only them being able to create an improvement plan, but it also helps us guide the best type of candidate because then I need to find a candidate who loves a bit of a confusion and who loves to sort it out and organize it versus someone who's like, I need to maintain something that's already set up. I'm not screwing around with you know, a, a disorganized company. So that process is, it can take a couple of weeks. Um, and then in a lot of instances, we've actually said no to working with clients because in, in recently we had to sit down. It was a very awkward meeting. I was like, 
<laughs> it was so awkward. I was so nervous. And I was basically like, your team are miserable. All of them said if they got a better offer for money, they'd take it right now. But they do. They have so much lack of self-confidence that they don't feel they can get another job. Wow. So when you hear that and they're like, can you hire for us? And I'm like, why would I hire for that? Why would anyone want to work in a team like this? Yes. So, yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. Well, actually, now that you've pointed that out, I was going to ask you whether or not I could lift the lid up a little bit on that. But, but, but I think there's going to be a challenging part to this question because clearly um, you've said that you don't then go work with organisations like that. So I'm curious about, you know, whether or not it's worth even writing a book about this because statistically <laughs> we know, right, we do know, like I, 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 as a coach, I work often work with people who want to elevate their performance as a leader and often the very first thing they will say is literally how unhappy they are in their current role or in their company and then there's all the myriad of reasons about that. But um, that's not always visible to the person that they work with, right? So um, uh, what your general sense on that, though, if you, you statistics, I mean, with you, you might have statistics, I don't know, but do you find that there's a lot of organisations out there like that at the moment? Um, we're pretty lucky because we work with so many great clients. We get a lot of referrals to other great clients. And I will say it doesn't mean we won't work with them because this is the thing. Even great staff who are like what I call an overachiever, someone who just goes above and beyond, which is what we want, right? They actually don't mind if there are things wrong, provided the owner has a plan in place and they're fixing it. That is the difference. So if I go, there was an ad that I wrote and I was like, this place is very unorganized. The owner doesn't really know what they're doing. They have no structure. They're looking, seriously, this is how we write ads. <laughs> and we have people that are like, you should never write an ad like that. I can't <laughs> believe a company. And I'm like, well, I'll be honest. Now the right person will read that and go, oh, challenge. So I wrote this ad for a CFO role and I, I, it was about 150 grand jobs, so quite a big job. But I basically wrote in there, the owner has had five um, EAs that didn't work out in the last year. It's very high. It's like very high um, pressure. It's very full on role. But you know what? You're bored. You're bored. You're looking for a challenge. This is what, this is what you need. And we had so many applicants and we had applicants that were on 500 grand a year apply to this job because they were like, I'm so bored. And when I read that, I was like, I want that job. So just because a company is not perfect doesn't mean you still can't get great staff. It's just, do you have a pen, plan in place? Are you open about that from the start? Because it's, it's one thing to say, we're a great company, la di da di da and we have great culture. And then they start and, you know, they don't even know who's who or they never sit together and they never have any engagement. So it's about transparency more so than perfection. Um, but yeah, it's just, an, it's an interesting, I love it because I, I, I feel this like, like I know what goes on and I'm like, <laughs> and no clients can't say no because I'm like, I'm sorry, we won't work with you if you don't do it. So I kind of force their arm a little bit, but it also gives us a good platform to improve things as well. So it's not just a blanket rule. If you're not perfect, we, we don't work with you. Yeah. I forget what your question was. I'm sorry. You have to ask no, me again. It's, it's, it's perfect. I, um, <laughs> it's perfect, right? I, 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 a big advocate on transparency and I think a lot of employees are too I, I think everybody at the end of the day it's, it's, again this is another one of those say do things right because I know mm -hmm. it's it transparency can be something that we say we want a lot of but then sometimes the transparency they, they doesn't always look good so <laughs> when the reality of transparency comes go through you go yeah maybe I actually didn't want to hear that you know so true yeah. yeah, well, I have a management course that we do. And at the start, before they attend, I actually interview their direct staff. And I do a similar thing, but I ask specific questions about their management style. It is brutal. And that's anonymous. So then they sit in this, the first session of the management training is like, okay, here's what your staff have to say about you. And because at the start, they're like, yeah, I want honesty. And one of the managers, something a couple of weeks ago, one of the managers read it and she was like, I wish I never read this. And I was like, but you said at the start you want transparency. It's exactly what you said. But then she's like, I don't think I want, like, I can't handle this. I don't, especially because that's, I know who that is. And that stuff, you know, then they go on their own, you know, uh, thing with it. But yeah, I think you're right. Some people think they want trans transparency until it's sitting in front of them and then they, they shy away from it. So Mm. So give, there's a um, uh, next thing I want to ask you about is your values and values-based uh, recruitment. And, I, and I'm asking you with this lens because um, I, I don't have the data on it per se, but I do know anecdotally, um, having read, read a lot of stuff and spoken to a lot of people, that we are in an era where there's a generation of people coming through and they're not taking a job for traditional metrics. They're actually taking a job because you know, they like the people or there's good values and people talk a lot about making sure the culture is the right fit. Um, how do you, you in terms of, um, let me think, how I was going to frame this. Um, do you think 
that this transparency is better off now because the generation of people who are looking for roles are, like, are people looking for roles that are more aligned with purpose or more aligned with values? Is what would what's your experience with that? Yeah, it's a good. I get asked this often. Like, what do good staff want? Um, so part of our team audit, I have data on this. Part of my team audit, we get them. We get each staff member to rank what's important to them out of 10 there are 10 different points so they put in sequence what's important good pay is one of them autonomy flexibility there's a few other things like career progression and things like that um and good pay sits at four and five in the av in average in every company overall out of we've done oh gosh i don't know how many we've done in 2021 we did probably 100 and 100 and something people. So it's like most people don't want money as the most important thing. Some people may say that and it'd be otherwise, but I actually believe them because they put things like the type of work or the oh, workplace, um, work, work life balance and culture are often the two top ones. Mm. Um, I think right now, just because they have so much choice, they're spoiled with choice. People want the work life balance. Um, but I think when it comes to culture, people want cult, uh, culture, people want challenge and career progression. That's what I found that people want. And out, out of all the jobs that we do, we have 20 on at any one time, roughly. I would say 80% of the amazing staff we find are not the most expensive in the candidate pool that we had. So we might have three candidates. The one we like the most is hardly ever the most expensive one, which I find really interesting because it, it actually defies the, the mantra, you know, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. It's, that's actually bullshit. It's not true. Um, and it also allows smaller businesses to have a go at finding great stuff so they're not getting scooped up all the time. Instead, what you have to offer is, what is it that this person wants? Everyone's different. Um, offer the flexibility where you can, really work on your culture, deliver what you promise, be organized, have a future, you know, have a, have a, have a space and a culture where they can promote, have, have ideas, they can be honest, they can, you know, all these things are what people want. And um, so I'd say it's definitely, definitely a huge factor of what staff are asking for. Mm. Okay, good. Now, I wanna, uh, what's your opinion about this great resignation? I think in some, in a lot of industries, it's not really real. I think you need to step back and actually look like a lot of people like seek is dead and you kind of do ads anymore and you've got to poach. It's like, well, 98% of our jobs close through seek. We're just very clever in how we post ads. We, we adjust things like that. Um, you don't have to go down the poaching angle if you don't want to. You just have to constantly reflect it as a manager or as an owner and go, what is it that people actually want? And what am I doing to create that? And I know this gets talked about a lot like the, employers uh, value proposition and all these they sound airy fairy but they're very real um so i would start with like actually auditing your current team what is it your team currently wants what is it that they uh like about the business what do they not like why did they join this company if they were to leave what would it, what would the reasons be um and really dig in and invite an open dialogue about it because a part of the great resignation is like if 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 you're not if you're not facilitating what other people are doing and then getting angry about it, it's what a lot of owners do. They're like, "Well, I'm paying them, and they should know." Or you know, these these you know throwaway comments that I hear, and I'm just like, "What? Who do you think you are? Like, what what makes you? Why? Why are you so brilliant? Tell me, sell it to me. Why would I work for you versus someone else?" And so, the gone are the days where you're just thankful to have a job. And I'm I actually like I'm kind of glad because. When you think about it, Kylie, it's like a survival of the fittest in a way of employers. It's like, well, if you're not brilliant, then it's kind of forcing you to be brilliant, which only adds to the challenge of business ownership. There's so much we have to get right in running a business or running a team. So it does make things harder, but I think it's, I think it's, it, it's time. It's time for employers to really step back and go, am I the best that I can be? Mm. You raise an interesting point about how, how to have somebody choose you over a competitor and what has you be somebody that you know, um, has your talent choose you over anybody else? So the things that actually stand out that you'd say makes that possible? Yep, culture. So if they have feel a good vibe when they're interviewing, even simple things, one of the biggest things we get good feedback on from candidates is that we reply. The most basic human expectation is if you communicate, you get a response. So many people don't even reply to applicants. If you reply and be like, I'm sorry, you didn't make it or, that the, the PR that your business has or the, the reputation that it has is such a big factor. So how they feel during the hiring process. Are you rude? Are you, are you on time? Uh, you know, how are you um, portraying your business? That gives them a lot of good vibes because I've had candidates come, come for an interview with one of our clients and choose our client for 40 grand less just because they like the culture, just because they like the founder. 
So really, I think when you talk about vision and you talk about passion and you talk about values, I think if you are that type of person that can define that and evoke that in your hiring process, you will attract people that like that as well. So the culture piece is big. Um, and then I find career progression and challenges big as well. Like mm-hmm. even though, yes, look, people are getting offered a lot of jobs, like there are a lot of people in, in overpaid jobs out there that are bored, mm-hmm. that need a challenge and want and want to want their work to mean something. So I think if you can play on those strengths, do you have a career progression? Do you have a vision? Where are you going? What are you working on? And those type of things I think really can appeal to those candidates. Well, now I'm stuck on the next question because I wanted to ask you brought up, you know, having a sense of meaning. So I'll come back to that one in a minute because that's going to bring me back to your sense of meaning um, and why you do what you do and, your, and where you got started. But one question I want to ask you back on the topic that we started talking about, about, um, you know, the gap between what we say and what we do and making promises that we don't keep. And I, I'm going to bring this one up here specifically because of the area of culture. You know, the, the, the in numerous times um, that I've spoken also within organisations with people about culture and one of the biggest complaints is, oh, you know, the culture doesn't align with my values and uh, no longer works with my values. And yet their, 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 initial, um, their initial kind of perspective uh, or experiences, oh, this company has a great culture. Uh, it looks on the surface like it is really great. They've got great vision statements up on the wall and, you know, their values, <laughs> these beautiful little things that say that their their values are, you know, all over the walls <laughs> of the company. And, you know, they have a pool table, Kylie. They have a pool table. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, look, I, I laugh and I say that this with a sense of humour because there are companies who are doing it really, really great, Right. And, um, but, you know, it doesn't live there. It doesn't live on the wall. It doesn't live in a piece of paper. It doesn't live in a document. It doesn't, it, 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 it has to live, that has to live and breathe with, within who we are. So I, I want to, I'm interested in what you've got to say about this and your experience about it, because specifically on the lens of, you know, how much do we see people go, oh, it's what I say, but actually the reality is it's not what I'm doing. Yeah, I think People need to realize culture, that word I love and I hate at the same time because it's tangible, but it's intangible and it's important. But then it's like, it's just, it's a complicated word. And I find you have to step back and remember that culture is an accumulation of individual relationships. It's how your, it's your relationship with that, your staff member, it's that staff member's relationship with the other person. It's the connection that you have with these people. So sometimes culture can seem so overwhelming. And then you focus on the cosmetic cultural things like, getting a pool table or doing a monthly thing or whatever. And these, these can be great or they can be cosmetic depending on the, the, the structure and the depth of those connections because you can have all those cosmetic cultural things and not have any culture or you can have the best culture and have no cosmetic things at all. So you've got to focus and break down what actually is culture. Culture is individual connections between people and when you focus on that, you will win. So do you feel you know your staff members? Do you, your direct staff, do you feel you know who they are? Do you know what they love? Do you know what they're looking for? Do you know what they value? For example, you could even look at um, even love languages in the context of work. Like, do they do they need um, recognition? And if they do need recognition, do they need monetary? Do they need it? Do they need to be um, told verbally? Do they need to be announced? So even just however you want to structure your relationship with each person, that culture is a combination and a, and a composite of all of those connections. So sometimes it can seem overwhelming and you feel you have to put in all these plans. Just I, my advice is just to step back and go, okay, get real with each staff member and, and really um, focus on building that connection. Well, number one, I love that I asked you that question. <laughs> uh, and number two, oh, I love your response. Oh, <laughs> you Good. remind me. Um, I, I remember getting on a, my soapbox once, um, and I ended up putting out a quote on it. I think it was, you know, people complain. I'm going to say people, right? We complain about society being a particular way. You know, look, even look at the whole thing around body image and stuff, right? Oh, I am this way because the society. I'm like, hold on a second. Society is just a makeup of a group of individuals you know no different a company is actually just a bunch of individuals working together so so I really really love um, what you said about that and now now coming back to the individual um, and you in a sense of meaning and purpose you I want to hear about your you know your entry into this how how you got here how you got started you know why are you so passionate and and in my humble opinion bloody damn good um, (laughs) in the way you're going about it but um, how did this start for you So when I was 19, I got a traineeship in a small boutique consulting firm in Leichhardt in Sydney. 
Um, and I worked my way up. So I started cleaning dishes and then, and, and, you know, creating client materials. And the, the, the curriculum that we used as a consulting firm was a very laid out specific curriculum. So it wasn't based on experience. So that's why I was able to start consulting at a young age, because as long as I was good at applying the curriculum to a business and making sure the business owner understood it and could apply it, you could be a good consultant. So I didn't need all this world experience. I mean, of course it would help, but I didn't need that per se. So I started in that and uh, worked my way up. And I think my, my career really broke out when I had, I really broke through my career when I was about 23. I got a job. Um, one of our clients was in uh, Cameroon, Africa. And my boss was tasked with going over there. It was a company on the London Stock Exchange. It was a natural gas mining company. And he got tasked to go over there for seven months to do a project to organize it and restructure it. And it was losing a bit of money at the time. And it just needed to kind of, it had some life injected to it. And he opted to bring me along. And originally the chairman in London said no, because I hadn't been to uni and I was too young and I don't want her. And my boss was really sweet. And he's like, I'm not going if money's not coming. Uh, so he put his foot down and we ended up living there for seven months. So mm -hmm. that was a real journey, eight months actually. And that was a, um, a real journey. We had 130 staff we had to work with and organize and, um, we ended up doing quite a lot of good work. I don't want to say too much because it's a bit private, but um, it, we ended up transforming a lot of things and, and, and having a lot of good results in that area. But also I think what was really impactful for me about that trip is that I don't know if you know much about Cameroonians or, or Central West Africa, but they're quite religious, spiritual people. And I'm a spiritual person myself and I really admire um, the practice of religion in a good way. And I found it to be a very spiritual experience because what we would do is we'd teach our curriculum and then these, these staff of these companies would go back to their village and teach their family what we taught them and come back to us and feed it back to us. It was quite, even though it was very commercial and important and stock exchange and value and all these things, but then it was also very soft. I remember this one session I had with the HR manager. He's this huge African man. He's very tall. He's named Simon. Oh, I miss Simon. And he was sitting there and I was showing him this framework on honesty and integrity. And he sat there and I turn over and I hear this sniffles and he's crying. He's got these tears going down his face. I'm like, Simon, what's wrong? He's like, I feel like God is talking to me. And it was just like one of the most touching moments of my life. So it's like, you know, I was on this incredible journey that was like all these things in one. And it was such a great experience. And I always, I always thank my, my old boss for, for giving me that because he put his faith in me and he trusted me. And he said, and I was a bit nervous, you know, I'm 23 and I'm handling this company and this, these men, I'm telling them what to do this, this, these men that are on 500 grand a year wages, you know, and who the hell am I? You know what I mean? So it, was, it was a really, really amazing experience.